Okay. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you might live, be living. Good evening, wherever you might be uh, eating dinner pretty soon. My name is Don Ochman, editor in chief and publisher of Hydenet Publications. And we are very fortunate to have as our forum panelist today uh, Mike Larson, who is the senior director of international sales, hides, and tannery at Tyson Foods. He's primarily responsible for probably selling more hides and wet more wet blue than any other U.S. producer, for all I know, any other producer in the world. Andy Seward, Seward in London, uh, live from London, and he is, sounds like a TV show, live from London. He's president of Seward, how do you say Seward? Seward, Seward? Seward, Seward. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, they were speaking English okay. before I was, but I didn't get it right. Seward. Material Solutions in the UK until recently, and for about 100 years or so, Andy was responsible for buying leather from Clark's, for Clark's International, which is one of the world's largest producers of leather footwear. And then David Peters, who's down in Sarasota, Florida, smart guy, knows to get out of the cold weather. David has had leadership roles in high processing, wet blue, uh, major American packers, tanning, automotive leather seating, uh, GST, high procurement, supply chain management, Grew up in his family's UK footwear business and for many years associated with the world's largest high trading companies. And before we get going with our interview, we just lost Mike Larson's picture. Here he is. Nope, he's back. Mike is having a little, we're having a little uh, problems. Must be all that snow in Sioux City. Uh, we're we're going to encourage all of you on the bottom of your screen, it says viewer questions and suggestions. This is a live interactive forum, seminar, whatever you want to call it. So feel free to type in any questions that all of our panel members will be able to see, and then uh, we'll try to address all the questions we can, as soon as we can. Um, I was gonna ask Mike the first question, but now we don't have Mike, uh, but he'll be back, I hope. Uh, I'll ask David, because he's closer to the packing industry in Mike's absence. Uh, David, how do you see the world's uh, cattle supply versus world demand? David. Well, I, I, I think some interesting things have, uh, are happening in, in that the supply is, is getting a little smaller. There are some regions that have uh, grown a little bit. But what's happening is the average weight of the animals are getting a little bigger. So we don't need to slaughter as many animals to create the same amount of beef. Um, that's good for the beef industry. It's more efficient but it's not good for the leather industry because the numbers are not gonna be there. And based on projections, um, we're gonna see um, kill numbers around the globe continue to erode a little bit. As I said, there'll be some pockets, maybe, maybe Brazil, um, but other areas, uh, I think we'll see less numbers, but bigger hides. Well, so we're gonna have more hides or less hides? Less hides. And how many less would you get? This is worldwide, correct? Yes. Uh, Mike's, Mike's on. Maybe Mike can offer an Mike, opinion as well. Again? Mike, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mike? No, I can't hear Mike. <laughs> can you? We're having problems with Mike. Uh, maybe he'll come back in. And when you do come in, we can ask about this. You don't see any of this, do you, Andy? You don't have no effect of there's plenty of leather all you want to buy. There seems to now. be plenty about uh, price is still. Uh, I can hear you now. Is, is is still an issue? Well, one thing. Good. One thing I'd like to ask Dave and and Mike, especially after what Dave just said uh, about the bigger hides. Um, so we're going to have less availability of leather. What about the quality aspect? Because I'm sort of thinking from a shoemaking point of view, bigger hides. I I'm thinking spreadier hides looser bellies, bigger uh, bigger pockets. So are we gonna see a, a, a drop in, in the quality of uh, material? We just lost David at an opportune time, but we have Mike. <laughs> Mike, can you answer that question? Oh, here's David. David, can you yeah. answer that question? Did you hear it? Yeah, I, 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 I think um, the, the animal's gonna be plumper. I don't, I don't Think they'll be spreadier. I mean, there are. Um, you can make the argument, but um, I, 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 I think um, you're just going to see bigger, firmer, stronger animals that will produce heavier yeah. hides. The thickness will be consistent, and uh, 
that just be heavier. Instead of a, a 58 or a 60 pound trimmed and fleshed brine cured equivalent, they'll be 68 to 70 pounds or 70, 72 pounds on American standards. Well, uh, what's the difference? Okay. They'll just split them, correct? I mean, we'll have bigger splits. You'll have better splits, yes. A bigger splits. Okay. Right. Uh, I want to wait for Mike to come back to talk about the markets. And again, any of you out there who have any questions to ask David or Andy and eventually Mike, be sure to type in those questions so we can see them. Uh, and I'll ask David another question, and I'll ask Andy as well from his point of view. Do you see more wet blue and less wet salted worldwide? Is what's wet yes. salted from major origins going to become a thing of the past? Yes. Yes. Sim simply put, yes, th there's going to be a continued growth in wet blue or further processing nearer the source. So what, let's say in Brazil, which is already almost all wet blue, in North America, mm -hmm. and what, what percent of Europe is wet blue now, would you guess? You it's hard to tell. No, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't put a figure on it, to be quite honest. I mean, it's a substantial amount. A large amount. A large amount. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you yeah. think the day of the wet salted hide from major origins, North America and Latin America, and the EU, and the EU will will be a thing of the past? Wet salts? It's going to be in in in, in diminishing supply availability. Correct. Okay, and then how is that going to affect? Let me ask you, Andy. If you're buying leather, okay, do you even know or care if it, mm -hmm. if it came from a wet salted or wet blue hide? Yes, um, because it always worries worries us. From it, it, it doesn't if it's a consistent wet blue source, but if it's coming from different wet blue sources, it can have an adverse effect on the material, and you get a lot more variation in the material. If it, um, if it so it's all blue, about excuse the. Me. If it comes from wet salted or wet blue? Yes. Which? Well, when it comes from wet blue, when it comes from oh. different sources of wet blue. So I, yeah. ideally, you'd, um, you'd rather have leather from wet salted hides than wet blue. Well, we what what we need from a, a shoemaking point of view, view is a consistent product. As long as it's consistent, I'm not sure that it matters too much. But but you need a, a, a consistent product, a consistent source of wet blue. Well, the, the wet blue formula is different on every producer, correct? There's a difference, a little bit of a difference. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if you're buying leather from Tyson, wet blue, or you're buying it from somebody else's yeah. wet blue, and you want to put them together to make a particular order for leather, you have a problem then, correct? We well, have to adjust there's your a, There's a possibility. Yeah, there is a possibility of a problem, yeah. yeah David, you were just involved in this in your last... Uh, mm -hmm. Lifetime, life work. <laughs> what do you say about that? You must have had that situation with your customers. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you, you know tanners uh, uh, like a certain control over the beam house, and once they get used to a a tannage um, in the blue, they don't they don't want to switch because they can um, gear their retan formulations to the wet blue, the incoming wet blue. So it's 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 not as easy to switch. Uh, they don't have the flexibility, but they have the consistency. Um, so yeah, I mean you can't take uh, wet blue hides and mix them from different producers as easy as you can uh, wet salted hides. Yeah, you can take uh, accumulation of wet salted hides and and ship them and then tan them, but you cannot do that, or you should not do that on uh, wet blue. And what's involved when you have to re when you do the retan to get the, to get it right? Well, it's, it's, it's very it's expensive, very costly. Well, it, it, absolutely. Number one, I mean, you start dyeing the leather and you're treating it a certain way, um, and it depends on your finished product. So you want to make sure that you minimize your your areas of uh, risk or inconsistency by stabilizing your raw material input. Um, in the retanage, um, you're, you're, you're basically setting your product for, based on your finished demand, and um, when it makes become more expensive. Well, we just had a little you break agree, here. Andy? Andy? There we go. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I agree. I, you know, 
consistency is is the key. And and that well, okay. If I'm a tanner in in China or any place in the world, and I'm buying wet blue from Tyson, I want to buy it from uh, the other two or three people who produce it, four or five people who produce it in North America now. I've got to be careful. I can't just put it all into one lot. I've got to handle each particular container separately. You should go. Yeah. You should go through an approval process. You have to qualify the raw material. It's much more extensive than qualifying raw hides. So you'd have to make sure you do a trial. You you ramp up uh, based on whatever volumes that you, uh, you 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 stipulate. But you you can't interchange as easily. As you can, Roman, you know, wet salted hides. Well, can you, in your experience, okay, you just were at Twin City Hide. Can you tailor your wet blue formula to the tanner's wishes? Yes, I think Tyson you should. started doing that way back, right? Correct. Did, did JBS ever do that? Or Montfort? Can you do that? Yes, you can. It, it, you know, it depends. You can tailor it to shoe. You can tailor it to, to furniture or automotive. It, it, every the recipes are specific to uh, the ultimate end product. So if Leather's Tanner made a, in the beam house, right? So if Tanner A wants this particular characteristic or formula, the producers, the big producers in America can, can give it to him? It, 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 Mike would be a better person at answering that question because obviously it depends on the volumes. Um, yes. and, and the smaller companies can, can do uh, um, more customization or for because their business is uh, geared around more uh, smaller runs as opposed to the larger uh, companies that um, need volume. Okay, and thank you. In the same vein, Andy, you have something to add? Well, no, I was just, just going to re uh, back up what David was saying that from from the the shoe maker or the, the the brand whatever the the finished leather user um it's all about being involved and knowing what's happening and and nobody worries too much about changing as long as they've been involved and and as david pointed out they've done proper tests and whatever um i think what happens a lot of the time is these changes go on and nobody really owns up to it or or comes out and say well this is what's happening we're actually getting the wet blue from a different source it just turns out my you know there's something changed in the formula blah 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 um but if the the tanner the the, the uh, and and the, the the shoemaker or upholstery or whatever uh we're working closer together this would help tremendously is that being done does that ever go on pragmatically i think I think it does go on, but not very, not very much. And it, it is one of the things where there is not enough communication between the tanner and the end user because they're probably um, trust is not the right word, but um, there's not enough uh, communication and feeling that they're working together on this. You know, there, as you pointed out, there may be a case where they they have to well, we've got a choice. We change the wet blue or you don't get the leather, right? Well, then work with them uh, in, in overcoming this. You know, we all know there's constraints and there's, there's changes. But, um, I mean, one of the big things I've got uh, 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 after years and years in the trade is, is there's got to be more openness, more working together with people. And, and I, I think this is a prime example. The lack of communication. So if you're a major brand, and you have 10 tanners who are making leather for you. Can that major brand <laughs> tell those tanners? He tells the tanners the properties he wants in the wet blue, but those 10 tanners are buying wet blue from different areas. What's that? What's the leather look like then? Can he make the properties yeah. the brand wants? You know what I mean? The brand, sh the br in my opinion, the brand shouldn't be telling the tanner uh, what what constitutes good leather. The tanner is the is the expert. He should be putting forward the leather, specifying it totally, and the brand should be in in in, his, in the the tanner's hands. And if you're getting inconsistent, and if you're well, if you're not, it's, it's your choice. The choice for the brand is don't buy it. Don't buy it from that. If they're not be producing consistent material, 
don't get it from there. But it's the tanner who, who understands the technical qualities and requirements of the tannage, of the wet blue, etc. Tell but, but perhaps you know you perhaps you got perhaps you got some better brands in the states, but I don't know of any brands who could start talking to tanners uh, about quality of wet blue. I think I think if you can I, I can just add one thing in here, and I think the the important thing is process control, and I think the companies demonstrate uh, the, the wet blue converters that demonstrate strict process control, that they have systems in place to make sure that there there's repeatability on the formulations and that if there are deviations if there are changes is that they notify the as as Andy said correctly that they notify their customers of any changes either in availability of chemicals or even in process times or or something happens during the process um, th that's what everybody's looking for and, and but today it all boils down to you know process controls Okay, and I would imagine that if a tanner wants that brand's business bad enough, he'll do what Andy says, and vice versa. If the brand wants that tanner as a supplier well enough, that's what everybody's traveling all the time for, I guess, to get these things right. Is that right, Andy? Well, yeah, traceability is becoming more and more of an issue, and yeah. and and it's throwing all this to light. So everybody has everybody's more engaged because at the end of the day, the guy who's making finished leather would would have outsourced his beam house to a, uh, a, a, another entity. All right, here's a question, but I can't, I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't see it. Question Mohammed asks, now uh, I can't find it. Anyway, uh, do any of you know the percentages of consumption of finished leather by industry, footwear, furniture, auto, and clothing? Yes. What is it? Okay, right now footwear is running between 55 and 58% of all available hides. Automotive is second between 17 and 19 percent. Residential upholstery is around 10 to 12, and the rest is a is a, is a mixture of belts, bags, and uh, other sundry goods. That's interesting too, because the 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 luxury handbag thing, which people talk about a lot, is uh, not such a big deal. In it's the overall consumption. Well, I think the important thing goes back to your original question. The pie is only so big; it's a zero-sum game. So if, if, for example, if the shoe industry takes 100% of the pie, there's no hides left for anybody else. So as automotive expands, somebody has to give up. And, and right now, shoe is in a decline as far as total consumption of bovine material. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm only talking bovine. Right, right, right. These numbers are bovine too, correct? Yes. Yeah, must be, of course. Okay, here's the question, if I can figure it out. Thank you. The Indian upholstery market is on the rise. However, the cost of splits is also rising significantly. And the main consumer of the split, wet blue market is local market, and it seems very competitive. Where can the, where's another split source with the price being almost near about the same? I don't know. Do you guys understand that? Oh, Mike's back. Mike, can you hear us? I can hear you. No, I don't think Mike can hear us. <laughs> Anyhow. You can hear me, Mike? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Nope, we have Mike, we don't have Mike. Okay, Mike, if you can hear me, I'm, I'm gonna drop this question from India for a minute and ask you where do you see the market setting now in, in, in the world and in America? Can you hear me, Mike? Yes. Nope, we got Mike's picture, we don't have that. I'm I sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't understand, Frank. I can hear you now, Mike. Can you yeah. hear me? I can hear you. Nope, guess not. Oh, you can hear me. So can you answer me? Where do you see the world and American hide and wet blue markets headed in the near term? Well, I think the near term, the most important issue is what's happening on the West Coast and how the fallout from all of that will occur. Okay, could you talk about that for us? I think that the um, most of the hides... Could you... Could you I think that most of the hides on the West Coast are probably sold. But I think there's probably a portion that are not. And then we're going to have to be very concerned, I think, about um, performance after the West Coast issue gets resolved. And I, we don't know when that's going to be. No, but, you know, let's say it's, it's two to three months away, and then do we miss the window 
of opportunity for the the key leather demand. But I think right now where we see the market is uh, slow season. We still see the market is relatively steady. Um, people are forgetting how many cattle we lost back in 2007, and even to today we haven't recouped that worldwide. Um, we're very very tight right now for cattle in the U.S. And I think it's all, uh, if we get a real spurt in demand on U.S. hides out of Asia, the market's going to be a lot different than it is today. So we don't know what's going to happen. What effect, I'm trying to repeat this because some of your message is broken up. So what you're saying is this West Coast situation is having a serious effect on the market, either conversely or virtually, whatever. It's, it's a big problem that clouds the forecasting? I think it clouds the forecasting because, as I said before, we don't know what is sitting on the West Coast that may be unsold. I don't think there's a lot of packer hides that are unsold. What's uh, sold or not sold? Packer sold hides, are, direct sales are unsold. I do think, though, that there might be a small portion of other hides that might be unsold, but um, it's all going to matter on how the performance is after, after this gets resolved. But the numbers would tell us that, that uh, in the rebuilding phase, we're still not going to see enough cattle to make a difference on the cattle numbers until probably sometime in 2016. Okay. And, and in your opinion, you think there's ample world cattle supply to meet demand? Will world cattle supply go down or go up or stay the same? Will that affect the prices of leather going forward? Does it matter, or is it all demand, in your I, opinion? I, you know, we can speak better to U.S. supply, and we feel that maybe the world will go the same way. But we'll see. I think we'll see a, a, a gradual increase in world supply. You know, with grain prices, um, pasture available, with different agricultural issues, it, it's conducive for people to get back into the cattle business a little bit. So I think we'll gradually see the numbers increase. Okay. It's not a simple answer, in other words. It's not a simple answer. Right. If I had all the answers, I'd be not sitting in England answer. or in Sarasota. So where Florida. do you see the... Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. I said if I had all the answers, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> okay. So where do you see the market in North America? I think uh, the others are frozen. No, I, I, he's coming in and out. Mike, can yeah, you I can hear you. Now? Okay, we just don't have a great connection. We have it, but we don't have it. And I really want to hear what, like, everybody wants to hear what Mike has to say. Uh, we have another question here. Huh. I don't think, well, maybe David does. We have a question from Roger Hunman, Human, who says, what are the expected price trends for cow versus goat versus sheep? I have no idea, and maybe one of you folks do. Uh, what do you, anybody have a comment, Andy? David? Well, I, I can only speak uh, as if I'm right at this moment in time, and, and goat and sheep prices, uh, goat especially is staying fairly, fairly consistent. Uh, sheep, small increase but nothing much uh the bovine i'll leave to to mike and david <laughs> well let me ask you this okay again i don't know how how you how much you know about i don't know anything about goats and sheep is this lower cost leather making material going to gain in consumption the price will go up because it's a lower cost alternative i remember one time pig lining was a big deal in footwear Did you see more of that coming andy uh not not so much no not so much pig because i think people are, are from a lining point of view are moving more to synthetics ah because you've got some really good synthetics now that um can give you a lot less problems uh more consistent cutability obviously is a lot better so no i don't see a great increase in in pig i mean what i'm seeing in in my experience with the brands i'm working with is an increase in certainly in goat and sheep you're away more. from bovine. You're seeing more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You give yeah, a, yeah. A, is that all for lining? Or no, 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 no. Sorry, uh, for I'm talking outsides now for 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 uppers. 
What's a typical price per foot on that compared to a synthetic? Still more expensive? Yes, but it all depends because with synthetics, you can get a lot of quite premium products. And sometimes the synthetic can actually be more expensive than, than, than the pig or, or, or the goat. Um, but you need a story to go with it or, or, or to, to, to help a marketing story to help sell it. Um, but um, yeah, generally the synthetic is, is, is cheaper than, than even the goat, uh, certainly the goat and sheep. Um, pig, you, 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 can, you can pick up some good pig at, at very low prices. Even, even sheep and lamb is so cheap now, there's a glut of it, and it's still not I, convenient. I don't say it's huh? so, what? I don't say it's so, so cheap, but certainly cheaper than, cheaper than bovine. Yes. And get, you get some good quality stuff as well. So can't sheep, can't the ovine material compete with synthetics or still not? Yes, I think it can compete. Yes. Um, but a, a lot of brands still put a lot of faith in being able to say, look, this is a real leather lining rather than a synthetic, even if the synthetic actually nobody could tell the difference or can probably do a quite a good job, but people want to see a leather lining and feel they're paying, they, they're prepared to pay a bit extra for a leather lined shoe. Which leads me to my next question, okay, and we talked about this when you and I had a conversation a couple of months ago. Does the consumer know or care if it's leather in the product? Well, I think, the, I don't know, is the, <laughs> I think it varies so much. I think when we had this discussion, somebody from America said that the Americans don't don't worry. They it doesn't bother them. Um, certainly for the brands that I work were it with for many years, um, it did make a difference. And people particularly asked about whether it was leather lined. Um, so I think there. The, you know, some people don't worry, but 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 I think there is still uh, a, a big slice of the market that that see leather as a premium product that they want in their, okay, so their footwear. The world leather still has a panache that it still sells. It still helps the retailer market the product. David, you have a comment? I think so. I, I couldn't hear anything. You guys were frozen. So what was the question again? I'm sorry. We were talking with Andy about about the issue of uh, sheep and goat or relatively cheap leather making material. Okay. And and synthetics it has trouble competing mm -hmm. with synthetics. But as Andy points out, there's various quality issues with synthetics. So I asked Andy, does the consumer know? What does the consumer know or care? You have an opinion on that? Well, I, yes, I do. I think um, in the most cases, we've done a lousy job at educating the consumer as to the properties of leather. Um, I think the, the um, furniture companies have done a better job at introducing leather and, and getting public uh, on board. But as it relates to the automotive sector, it's been very, very hard because leather looks more like vinyl than it does like leather. Um, it, 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 we we have more lower grade hides than we do better grade hides, meaning that um, the availability of, of of clean hides is diminishing, and the availability of um, hides that produce say Ds, Cs, or whatever uh, is is increasing. So, in order to sell these without correcting them or using too much finish, we need to educate the consumer. Um, and when you start doing that, um, you potentially have the opportunity to sell more. Uh, but defining scratches or grain defects on leather and having the consumer accept them is well, going to be much, a big challenge. What to do about that with Leather um, Naturally, who's trying to get the industry together to promote the use of leather? And one of the, uh, nobody's against it, but somebody would say, a cynic would say like me, we've got all-time record bovine prices. So we're consuming all the leather we make in the world. Do we still have to educate the consumer? What do you think, David? Well, yeah, 
I, I think educating the consumer will will allow the use of the natural uh, characteristics of leather to be marketed um, more successfully than trying to obscure them with with more paint or more correction. Right. Mike, can you hear us? I don't know. Yes. I don't know if we can. Okay, let me ask. Let's go back yes, to the to the viewer. Andy's huh? um, yeah. frozen. As far as uh, I can see, yeah, you're okay. Am I am I okay now? I I just like to just I just like to say that I totally and absolutely 100% agree with what David had just said about the use of uh, you know natural natural uh, defects, if you for want of a better phrase, uh, in the leather, and I, I uh, and we as a an industry we got to do a much better job uh, at, at at that and. I often wonder how much the man in, or woman in the street are affected by these um, defects or, or, or whatever, and how much it is uh, the brands and, and, and people in marketing jobs in big brands who, who don't understand um, a lot about shoemaking and, you know, the same in, in upholstery. Good and, point. Uh, About two, three, four months ago, my wife dragged me through Nordstrom's, which is a major American retail upscale chain. And they had on display two or three pieces of foot, women's yeah. wear, or women's foot feet, with scratches. Like they made a whole big deal about a poor tan you could see or about the scratches in it. I saw that in a Timberland shoe. Natural defects. defects. I guess that's the way to do it. Is there more of that happening or less of that happening? Andy? I, 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 there's not enough of it. I mean, I go back to, I don't know, the, the early 70s, mid 70s, mm, yes, right, Crazy right. Horse, Prime Asia, a Prime, Prime right. uh, in America, rather. Um, you know, and, and I, I can remember a dear old chap in, in the warehouse when I was buying some uh, material from uh, Prime in America and saying, do you, do you realize I've spent my whole working life <laughs> trying to reject leather like this? And, and, and actually it was flying out the shops is, yes. what, is what people so wanted. You gotta sell, you know? you gotta with, sell within, the sizzle with the steak, time, right, David? I'm sorry, I, I can't hear Andy at all. So I, I, That's unfortunate. I can hear Andy you. Andy says don't. we need to do more of selling natural leather with the defects in. And I think we that's we can't we can't do that. The market's got to yeah. do that. The retailers yes. got to do it. But the consumer doesn't know. It doesn't care. Only the leather buyers know. Correct. And in the automotive industry, right. okay, and this is no secret. You can buy a uh, thirty, fifty, seventy, a hundred thousand dollar car, and you can confirm this for me, David. The back of the seat is vinyl. There's vinyl all over the place. Maybe where you actually sit is leather. And then you've made a comment before about the leather properties that are in that car vis-a-vis -vis the vinyl. Would you discuss that? Right. Well, you know, there are certain new rules in, in existence, especially in the European markets, that prohibit um, offering leather interiors where the vast majority of the interior is vinyl. Um, so, so that used to happen in Europe, but I think that's changed now with the new regulations of stating that if a car has leather interior, then then the car, it, and it, it has to be all leather. In the United States, that's not the case. Uh, in the United States, you're correct in, in that even the rear seats could be vinyl or they could be splits with a, 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 a PU coat or, uh, or elsewhere in the car. Only certain areas that touch the body are, are leather. But it's interesting that the leather has to match the vinyl, and it's and not the other way around. To make sure that the leather has properties that will last, it has to put all this coating on it, correct? And it correct, correct. It's bulletproof. So, it, I mean, quite, and, and it's correct because it has to withstand coffee spills. It has to withstand uh, insect repellent. It has to withstand uh, suntan lotion, those kinds of things which are normal in the in the confines of the car especially i'm sure in arizona where you have all three occurring every day so uh yes i i uh, the, the 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 leather is bulletproof and and as you as you start to use certain products uh to clean it 
uh, you, you wear off the finish. So at the end of the day, the best thing to clean a leather car seat is just water, you know, a leather, you know, Again, just wipe, it, back, wipe it clean. Going back because to the these footwear, finishes. the consumer doesn't know. Is that correct? You agree, uh, Andy? Consumer doesn't know? If it smells well, good. no, no, they, they, they don't know. But I think I, I think they're prepared to listen well, to the leather in shoes is very different store. than the leather in automotive. It doesn't have Mike, to can you hear yeah, this yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but Mike, it. no, we can see Mike. He's looking good, but <laughs> not coming through. So and I can't hear Andy. Uh, I can't uh, hear Andy either. Too bad. I, I'm I can't to hear him. But anyway, the bottom line is that we're all agreeing here is consumer education to sell lower grade leather, leather with defects, call it whatever you want, to the consumer. Correct, Andy? It, yes, it is. Um, but it's not just the consumer. Uh, what, sorry, when we talk about the consumer, I'm thinking the man yes. or woman in the street. Yeah, I think we need to do a, a marketing job there. And we, but we need to do an education job within the brands as well because there are so many people who don't understand what they're looking at what they're buying the grading and all this kind of thing that it's right through the supply chain there needs to be more communication uh, more interaction between the, the brands and the, brand. the retailer in other words you or i or anybody walks into a shop and we walk in to buy oh, a car, we oh. walk in to buy a sofa, we walk in to buy a pair of shoes. We don't even know if it's bicast or this other stuff they call all the synthetic leathers. We don't know if it's vinyl. And the salesperson probably doesn't know either. So how does the industry do something about that when we no. can't even find enough money to promote leather naturally? Well, I think if I can answer, because I can't hear Andy, but you know, I think you make a very good point that most of the people that are the front line in promoting leather know little to yes. nothing about leather and whether it's the guy the automotive salesman or whether it's the furniture salesman or whether it is the uh, shoe salesman i'm i'm just astounded that when i go in and speak to these people um they their perception as to how leather is made is zero their perception as to what is good or bad is zero and, and most probably what we need to do as an industry is to educate the salespeople um, or have training sessions or, or be able to give them leather 101, just, just a, a small background in, in, in how leather is, is sourced and, and produced. This will go a long way to sending the right education, message. And maybe the brands are the ones that do that, like Andy was in, in, in implying. Is that correct, Andy? That, that's correct, but but I would suggest that it goes back farther, back into the brands. I think within the brands, there are there are a very limited knowledge of, uh, of 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 the qualities of leather and what's needed. And I'm saying yeah. that from the aesthetic point of view, but I'm also saying it from the price point of view. Brands waste so much money throwing leather in the bin that if they had a, a, a knowledge of cutability of what will go into a shoe what will look good in a shoe they could not only make decent shoes but well, there's but a lot save to do money that, as david? well david you didn't hear me there's so that okay there's a there's a i don't hear oh, well, there's, so david i think repeat. andy's saying there's a lot of waste in the brands the brands buy the leather and they still have poor yields correct andy Okay, and there's a lot of waste, yeah. and that waste can, yeah. But, but that, that waste yeah, can be yeah, eradicated no, sorry, go on, or diminished, go on, yeah. at least, if you can market the off sorts. Correct, Andy? Yeah, yeah. I, what I'm saying is, I'm agreeing with what David's saying, but it, it, we're talking about it retail. We're talking about the man in the street. What I'm saying, it can go right back into the brand, the marketing managers, yes. the designers, you know, uh, there needs to be more knowledge of, of leather. And in my experience over the years, there is far less knowledge now yeah. than there was really 
certainly 20 years ago, but probably 10 That's years nice. ago. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Thank you. I want to yep. ask a question here. Is Fred Shortland has sent in a question. Why can't the industry work to an agreed standard for wet blue as a base material? Yep. Mike, can you hear this? Yeah, I can Mike? hear you. No, Mike. I can hear you. See, Mike. You can hear me? Good. 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 Could you answer that question? Then, uh, given the comments regarding, well, what? Wet blue to make wet blue standards. Why can't the industry work to an agreed standard for wet blue as a well, base material? I, I think different segments. <clears throat> I think different segments Mike. of the industry have different beliefs on what that standard should be. And from what I see, um, you just have to attend an LWG meeting to find out that not everybody in the in the whole leather sector is on the same page. I think the suppliers of wet blue. I think so the like suppliers of wet blue have worked well. Or the people that produce wet blue have worked well to try and establish those standards, but as it moves through the pipeline, more and more and more gets piled on and pushed back, and then it starts to look a little bit like we're we're not we're not all in sync. But I think as a base, the wet blue producers, especially in the US, are pretty pretty well in sync with what should be the baseline of a good piece of wet blue. Well, so do you think we're seeing, would you say, for example, I have to put words in your mouth, that we need the standards of wet blue like we have for hides in America and Europe, you know, U.S. standards well, think, and so on and so forth? I think most people adhere to those standards, especially in the U.S. I think when they produce wet blue, we try to adhere to the standards that we have from U.S. hide, skin, and leather for delivery of the common trade practices for proper delivery. I do think we all try to, um, to hold to that. But when you start right. getting down the line, and get other people involved, then here come all the different, um, all the different standards, all the different requirements that sometimes we can and sometimes we cannot meet. I mean, it's the baseline goal of a wet blue producer in the U.S. to produce a product that is sound and safe for the production of leather. David, do you agree with all this? You just finished doing this kind of work. I think well, yeah. I I I I tend to, I tend to look at it this way. I think one has got to establish whether you're selling a product or you're selling raw hides converted into the blue. I think there are are three challenges that we have. One is what is the selection anticipated? Um, are, when in the Brazilian sell TR1 as an example, we do not have a standardized selection on wet blue. Number two is what is the standard or what is the, the, the processing uh, standards. Um, we don't have a unified standard for processing. Each tannery has their own and to create a global unification standard is hard. And number three is traceability. Um, the transparency of producing wet blue is a manufactured product. So these are three hurdles that we have to overcome. But the first one is driven by the fact of saying, are we selling hides in the blue where we adhere to standard uh, practices governing the sale of hides? Or are we recognizing that wet blue is a product that has its own unique characteristics and standards that are separate to agree, hide Mike? standards? Uh, Mike? Well, I, I, I agree. I agree, but I think um, as we produce wet blue, we are producing a wet blue product. It's not as David said, you have to decide, and I think we've decided to be in the wet blue business and we're producing the wet blue. I think that when you come into the sorting, then that adds just another dimension to it. But I'm talking about from our standpoint on a TR wet blue, I think most suppliers in the U.S. are in sync with what a good baseline wet blue piece of leather should be. Let me, let me ask you, both of you, somewhat of a loaded question. Uh, do you think there's a difference between every producer, at least in America, in their wet blue quality? If I, you're selling, you guys are selling, you were selling wet blue, David, Mike, Mike, you're doing it forever. When you go to your customer, you say, buy our wet blue because it's better than blah, blah's wet blue. And why? Are there features that you guys can sell to make your wet blue more attractive than the other guy's aside from price? Given the same raw hide selection. Mike? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Mike, Mike has 
a lot of advantages that other companies are are um, not available to offer. He has a consistent product. Um, he has con not to, I want to say control of his raw material, but the characteristics of his blue, um, and he has diff four different locations. And I'm not here to sell for Mike, but he stands alone from other companies. Tyson produces a very consistent and well-respected product. Other companies don't have that supply stream, and other companies have taken uh, a different tact in selling blue. And the blue, at the end of the day, the selection is, Mike's correct, is a TR. Once you start selling selected blue, then you run into all kinds of issues. But at the end of the day, it's process control that, that trumps. And if you, if you have strict control over your process, um, ultimately the customers will find you or you'll find the customers and they'll become reliant Mike, upon you gonna, your product. Are you paying David for this uh, sales pitch, Mike? I uh, know, but um, we do have a, a, an ongoing agreement. <laughs> Good job, David. <laughs> Okay, here's another question. We're getting a little short on time. Uh, uh, a lady writes in, Kristen Wilson, I would love more education and information about leather right up the supply chain. Can anyone recommend a good comprehensive source, maybe an online uh, video? Can anybody write about that? David? <laughs> Did you hear my question? Um... Yes, there there is no comprehensive source, um, and it's well, a question of funding. We, we have our associations, um, you know. We have the, the I think, Munich. We have uh, the United States High School in Leather. We've got uh, what are they doing in um, uh, what's the one in Europe? The uh, EU has a has a organization. Yeah, Ishalta. All this. Ishalta. So maybe is this Ishalta. the answer to that question that our associations around the world need to do? The Indians has an association to educate the retailer. Is that the way to do it? Uh, Andy recommended the brands. Maybe you need to do that as well. Andy, you having a comment? Mm. Andy? Well, I certainly know, I yeah. certainly believe that there's the, there's a need for more education. I mean, uh, I I can't I can't really come up with a a, a group or whatever. So all the people that you've mentioned, um, you know, I mean. They're very good at talking shops, but do they actually do they actually understand the nitty gritty of what's required? I I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's difficult. In my experience, there's only one way to learn, and that's to get in and get your hands dirty and do the jobs and 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 learn that way. Um, right. There there there's you know there's loads of courses you can go on for a, for a couple of weeks, but if you think you're going to be expert after two weeks or whatever i think uh, you're you're you're, right. you're uh, kidding yourself um it, it, it's difficult i mean in the in the uk we got people like satra the blc all these people run sort of courses and 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 all these kind of things are are all useful um but working with people who've got the knowledge and experience is the key as far as i can see Okay, well, that was garbled. I think I understand. Here's another question. If if you yes. can hear me, Don, if you can, I can hear Mike, me. please, please. I'd I, I'd like to add that um, I would encourage the person, our Kristen Wilson, to start. Oh, just got cut off. Kristen Wilson. Well, when you can hear me, Mike, come back in. We we you started to say what you'd recommend to Kristen Wilson and. Uh, <laughs> We don't know what you're going to say, but we'll get it later, I hope. Here's a question from Jeff Barron. We're running out of time. I want to try to cover as much as we can. Uh, Jeff Barron, who's a consultant in the furniture industry, a lot of experience with leather with people like Matsusi and so on and so forth, says, will wet white ever become an issue in footwear as it is in automotive and become more important? Uh, what's the question? And become more important in furniture. I, he says IKEA is moving towards this 100% wet white. Uh, Andy or David, do you have some thoughts on that? Did you hear the question? Uh, well, actually, yes. I think wet white is less of an issue in auto than it used to be. Uh, one of the biggest consumers of wet white in auto 
Honda pulled out of uh, wet white and went back to using wet blue as a substrate. Um, I think the wet white and footwear, and Andy, I think the Europeans um, on children's shoes use a lot more wet white than chrome leathers. Is that is that mm, your impression no, too, to Andy? be honest? Um, certainly, I'm, I'm just go, just going by the UK. Um, certainly, the biggest producer of children's shoes in the UK would be virtually 100% wet blue may not be 100 percent, but 95 96 percent yeah what what i find with the wet white is um usually don't know why but usually everybody likes the sort of marketing side of it uh but then it comes to the price and somebody says well you're gonna have to pay a bit more and then people aren't so so interested Got a little more technical difficulty here. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear the whole answer, but I guess we can't do it. Um, Andy and Mike, are you back? Ah, Mike's gone. Uh, here's another question. We, we covered part of it anyway. Uh, thank you, Andy. Most brands, Fred Shortland says, most brands de depend or accept on the tanner's perspective unless a brand is leather specific. It's not a priority for a brand margin and volume are. Do you find that to be true, Andy? I do, but going by what I was what I what I was saying just now, I totally disagree with that way of of looking at it. And if they made it, if the brand made it more important in their uh, decision making on knowing about leather, they would improve their volume or ability to to uh, to to. Uh, the amount of leather they're using and it would affect their the, the price because if they know how to cut leather and the the intrinsic things about um the qualities of leather they, they'll make more money so actually i i i disagree with fred and and i would i've lost his i've lost i got his question at the top now um i would say a brand needs to be leather specific if it wants to increase its margins and if they increase its margins and then the volumes will increase as well right so again we talked about this before better communication between I mean, the brand the tanner even the wet blue i presume correct david yeah, i i mean i i made the point can you hear me david or or not at the moment okay okay yeah, yeah I, no, can, I can hear you now. What I made earlier on, from 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 my point of view, is I would never tell a tanner how to make some leather, right? I could tell the tanner the kind of qualities I need, but how long it's in the drum or what the wet blue is, that's their job, right? But by the same token, surely the brand should know about the leather, uh, sorry, should know about the shoe uh, or, or know about their product. To, 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 to say that you leave it to the tanner to decide is, in my mind, crazy. But to, make, to come back to your point, Don, what it needs is communication and working together and getting the knowledge of both ends of the, the supply chain there, the tanner and the brand, to put it together to, to, to make the best use of the material. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I want to, we're running out of time, so I want to cover one more area. Uh, maybe both of you can answer. I wish Mike was on. Uh, the, the shift out of China to other places to make leather and to make footwear. Uh, where do you, what do you see on that? Here's Mike's back. Mike, are you, can you hear me now? No. Anyway, <laughs> the shift out of China. The trend. Oh, good. Okay. You to finish your thought on Kristen. Yeah, I can hear you. Suggestion for Kristen wanted to get more uh, information to the to the to the retailer no i just was going to say for Kristen to come all the way back to the heights to start the education process i think it's very important today that people understand what the input hide looks like before they start with the leather the, the hides are changing all the time 
regionally um, with weather, uh, with animal husbandry and the feedlots. And I think okay, it's important that to learn about leather, you need to learn about hides. A guy who spends half his life in the Far East, where do you see the trend going, continuing and ending up on manufacturing moving out of China in our industry? Well, I think it's going to move a little bit. I mean, it's in the last few years, it's become quite nomadic. But I will say that I think from where China was, say, three years ago, even two years ago, I think at worst case, they lose about 80 percent or lose about 20 percent of that at the most. I think at least 80 percent of what was China the next, in the heyday uh, will probably the still stay in China. Efficient, infrastructurally sophisticated production country, do you think? Well, from what I hear, it's um, depending on productivity, but Andy could probably answer it much better. But I would say uh, we're hearing a lot about Bangladesh, Myanmar. Um, I've heard Pakistan. I've heard uh, Africa. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's going to stay in Southeast Asia because I think they understand the industry. And I think so, that's some of the best productivity in footwear. So you think? Uh, don't forget Mexico. Yes, don't forget Mexico. Mexico will come. You think any of it's going to move back here? Into America or back to England or back to Europe rather? Oh, sure. I do think so. I think uh, it'll be, I think some will move back to the U.S. I think um, with ISA opening their new tannery in the U.S., um, I think it's going to be the start of good things to come for the leather industry here. It's not going to be near as big as it was back in the, I want to say, back 40s, 50s, 60s and historically, but it's good to see somebody coming back so to the U.S. So basically, it's not all going to be done in China anymore or Korea. It's going to be spread around more. Is that what you would say? I think it will be, but I think there'll be there'll be a number where China will stay. I think they'll stay okay. at 80% of where they were that. in One the more, I have another question because I'm running out of time. To Andy, uh, when you're buying leather, okay, do you do you care the country of the origin of the of the raw material? You yes. Hear me, Andy. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. Just just think. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah. Horses for courses. Uh, you know, uh, there are there are obviously issues with with India with um, uh, in in terms of animal husbandry. Uh, and then you, obviously you've got things like Brazil in terms of uh, quality and selection. So yes, yes, I, I, mean, I mean, take assuming that the leather quality is the same, the, the defects and all this. Does, the, does your cut? Does the brand care that much, or does he really have to know what the country of origin is of the raw material? Yes, yes, it's important. I think it's, imp it's important that they, that they do. Uh, the, uh, the traceability okay. is becoming very important. You get a lot of the public now asking, especially on particular, obviously particular countries, things uh, that come up on the internet or on the television. So yeah, yeah, we we need to know where okay. it comes from. David, in your experience in the automotive business, does the car maker care where the raw material came from? Less so today than they did years ago. Um, what they care more about today is that uh, the the company can support their needs as they flex, and that the price meets their requirement. As far as the raw material, um, there are a few um, uh, vehicles that mandate um, either North American or USA. But overall, that requirement has uh, dissipated over time as the automotive business expanded beyond its um, um, on, beyond where it was. I mean, the real the, the realistic issue is: Do we have enough raw material to satisfy the automotive business? And when you start looking at it from that perspective. You can't be, you, you, something's got to give. So you can't be so strict as saying these are going to come from here or there. I think what, what they are strict on is that the controls over how the leather is made, the consistency, the performance, um, the repeatability, and the just-in-time requirements are all uh, adhered to. Okay, thank That's you, David. We're out of time. we got about 10 seconds left. 
I just want to thank you all very, very much for putting up with the few little glitches we had technology for your tremendous input and experience. And I hope all our viewers really enjoyed this. And I want to thank everybody who wrote in and asked questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them. And this forum will be available uh, on HideNet uh, in video. So you can watch it and uh, you can take notes and we'll try to write it up in our next HideNet market reports. Again, thank you very, very much for watching and for the three of you for participating. Have a nice rest of the day or evening. Thanks. Bye. Okay. All the best. Cheers. Bye-bye.